So Dr. Bradley, welcome to the show. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janine, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Um, and, you know, giving an economist seven minutes to talk about communism was probably a smart idea because I could talk about this all day. But um, I think it's so important for the time that we find ourselves in today uh, and the way we kind of think about how to generate prosperity, well-being, long lives, community, happiness. These are all things that universally people care about. So I want to talk about how communism in particular does not get us to those things. And so that's the bottom line right up front, which is that communism is a failed system, both political and economic system. But as an economist, what I think we can do, and I think it's very important to do in these conversations, is to distinguish this as what I'm going to say today is not an ideological attack on communism. We could make those, but I'm going to make an economic argument or critique of communism, it, that it doesn't work. Because economics is always and everywhere concerned with efficacy, meaning do the means we choose to use obtain the ends we desire? And in attempting to do that, do the benefits outweigh the costs? So that's how economists think. And so uh, I, I actually think that this can be a really added um, intellectual tool that people can use, because I think it's really fun, probably, right, to have conversations with your friends who disagree with you, you know, and you can maybe have those conversations late into the evening. Um, but those conversations that are only ideological in nature tend to actually make people just dig their heels in further to their own ideology. And so what economics does is it provides us a way to think through the system. So let's do that really briefly. In doing so, I'm going to bring up comparisons to capitalism or more open economies, because that's really the range of alternatives that we're talking about here. So when we think about economics, we have to do a couple of things. We have to come up with a theory about how the world works. And then, as my professor used to always say, we have to take that theory and shine it out the window and say, does our theory help us explain the world? If our theory helps us explain the world, it's probably a good theory. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's good. If our theory about the world does not explain the world, then our theory doesn't work. And so I think this is where economists have something to offer about the failure of communism as a system that led to more equality, more community, more prosperity, all those things. And of course, the communists, um, and you know, kind of we think about this term has a long history uh, but really popularized by Karl Marx, of course, a name that's probably familiar to all of us. He wrote a book called The Communist Manifesto. And of course, this was really picked up upon by authoritarians in Russia, uh, in the Soviet Union, ex excuse me, former Russia, or Soviet Union is now what Russia is today. And of course, this has been picked up by other authoritarian leaders. It was deployed in Mao's China. We have experimented with collectivizing resources in today's Venezuela. So this is why I think it's really important for us to understand this issue today, because although Marx is long gone, um, and you may say, oh, you know, nobody really thinks communism is a good idea. I think that's not probably true. I think that there are people, particularly in academic institutions, who do think that communism is worth a shot. And you've probably heard some people say things like this. Well, Marx, you know, his ideas weren't bad. It's just that true communism has never been tried. So people will say, make that argument. They'll also make it the argument that, well, communism isn't bad. It's a really good idea. We just had bad leaders. We just had bad people run with it, like Mao, right? Mao was a bad guy. He was an authoritarian zealot who only cared about power. And so he took communism in the wrong direction. Or you might say that about Lenin or Stalin. They just did the wrong things with it. So often what you'll hear about people who are attracted to communism today, or some version of it, is that we just haven't really tried good communism yet. So again, economics allows us to delve into whether there is such a thing as good communism. So what is the first thing the economist does? We say, what are the goals of any type of policy, it can be a little policy, or it can be kind of this big economic system that we're analyzing today. What are your goals? Your goals are, and in terms of what the communists, a la Marx and Engels and others were advocating for, they were advocating for a propertyless society that would yield a utopian community, right? So a the word utopia is very attractive to us, isn't it? 
it sounds good. It sounds like a place where you want to be. It sounds like a place where you don't have to ask for food. Nobody's starving. People help each other, right? So Marx's vision of communism was that the way you got that was to eliminate property rights, to eliminate prices, and to eliminate profit and loss. So those things in economics, we call those the three Ps. I refer to them in that way a lot. Property rights, prices, profits and losses. So remember, I said I was going to juxtapose. In a market economy, some might say a capitalist or free economy. What are the goals? The goals are rising incomes, human flourishing, high standards of living, community, happiness. There are people in capitalist systems that also advocate for equality, right? I think one of the questions is what type of equality are we advocating for? Marx was advocating for an equality of outcome. Right. So we're going to have the same things. We're going to have each according to his needs. Right. So the way that property was going to be distributed in a communist utopia, it, it begs certain questions of us, which is who is going to be in charge and who is going to say who gets what and how are the people in charge going to know who should get what? Moreover, how can we ensure that they're not going to take that power that they're going to have to have to make those decisions and not go rogue with it? right? And not do bad things with the power. So to contrast what Marx's goals were, or the communist goals, capitalism has the goal of human flourishing, high standards of living, right? Being able to buy things and sell things, being able to choose professions, well-being. So what's the difference? And this is where I said, you know, economics allows us to compare systems. The difference is, and I think this is the fundamental problem with why communism didn't work under Lenin or Stalin, it didn't work under Mao. It's not gonna work anytime we try it in the future. Any society that tries it, it's not gonna work and here's why. Marx's view of you know, how you get to utopia was based on false assumptions about the human person. Any good economic economist, excuse me, has to start their analysis with what is true of all people, right? We can't design an economic system around how we want people to be or how we wish they would act, we have to design systems around pe how people actually are. And how are people, in fact? They are self-interested. And this doesn't mean that we're always greedy, but it means we're sometimes greedy, right? We are fallen, we are finite, meaning we can't do everything ourselves. And so what we need is a system that allows us to rely on each other. And we want to do that in a peaceful and cooperative way. So human nature is the starting point of why communism is never going to work, because if you eliminate property rights, the first thing that goes away when you do that is the incentives for us to use our resources, our limited resources, both land, both labor, both capital, but our human capital, right? I always say, what's between your ears? That's the most important type of capital. That's where ideas come from. So we need to have live in a society that encourages all of us to fix problems, right? To take that human capital between our ears and solve the problems other people have. In communism, it doesn't work because when you abolish property rights, you abolish the incentives for people to use their scarce resources in the most productive way. Capitalism, here's the thing that's amazing about it. It doesn't require men to be angels. If you've read right? Um, the American founding documents, James Madison was very famous for this, right? If you read the Federalist Papers too, um, you know, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. But if men were angels, even if we needed government, we would still have to control government. This is Madison's point. It works on both sides, right? We need government to help us do what we can't do through the market. But in giving government power, what do we have to do? We have to restrain government because it's made up of the same people, corruptible people, self-interested people, people prone to greed, right? So the difference between capitalism and communism is essential to the starting point of our assumptions about how people are gonna behave. For Marx's system to work, people have to be altruistic all the time. We have to say, I'm only gonna take according to my needs, but we also have to divorce ourselves from our own self-interest and say, the leadership knows what I should do. So Marx, it's no coincidence that he wanted to abolish the family. He wanted to abolish religion. He did those things. Why? Because that's where we get our values from. 
that's where we get our humanity from. I mean, that's how it gets developed, right? So if you abolish the family, then you exist to serve the state. Communism requires that of us. And this is why communism always requires force. So if you're going to take away, so remember, the key is we're making certain assumptions about human nature. And then we're saying, well, when you have those assumptions and you take away property rights, what do you lose? You lose productive incentives to use our human capital and other forms of capital to serve other people. But actually now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to have an authoritarian force tell me what to do. And when I say no, they're gonna have to make me do it. Which is why communist societies had gas chambers, execution lines, none of that as an accident. That is a feature of the system, not a bug, right? Capitalism is different why. We make the same assumptions about human nature, but what do we have? We have the three Ps, prices, property rights, profits and losses. It doesn't mean people never make mistakes and it doesn't mean you're never gonna see greed or you know, kind of corruption in markets. It's that that gets weeded out much more quickly. Why? Because people can see what you're doing and in markets, consumers have the right to, what I, to, to say no thank you. In communism, consumers don't have the right to say no thank you. Again, this is why the shelves were always empty in communist societies. This is why the shelves of the grocery store in Venezuela are empty today. They're empty because there's no mechanism to encourage entrepreneurs to deliver the goods. In capitalism, think about it, even during a pandemic, if you went to the grocery store in my town at 11 p.m. on a Tuesday night in April of 2020, guess what? There was nothing in the grocery store. Because people were shuttered, we were in lockdown, all that stuff was happening, right? But what was amazing about it, the next day it was restocked. In capitalism, the next day it gets restocked even when we run out. Why? Because of incentives. It's not because people are better, more righteous, or smarter. It's because they face different incentives. So I can talk all day. I want to make sure I leave a lot of time for our comments and questions. But that's the economic way about thinking about the failure of communism. And then again, like I said, I think economists always have to all offer alternative systems. Capitalism is one, right? That gives an alternative system that relies on different incentives. So I'm going to give it back to whoever is going to moderate the Q&A. Thank you. Um, and you just tell me what, what I do next. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bradley, thank you. It's terrific, terrific opening. Um, I, uh, gosh, I have so much running through my mind. Atlas Shrugged. I encourage everyone to read Atlas Shrugged because it talks about the loss. It, it, I think what she talked about in Atlas Shrugged so well, uh, I and ran, uh, however you want to say her name, is the loss of incentive that people felt. Um, and it's so hard to explain because it's, it's really hard to juxtaposition this utopian thought. Um, and yet, I think it may be perhaps, and correct me if I'm wrong, a good way to explain communism is you're going to work all day and you're going to make $100, but you're not going to get any of it. So it's, it's sort of, you know, taxes. It would be as if in America, we, we work and we make $100 a day, but the taxes are 90%. So we end up with, or 95, we end up with, you know, $5. And so people think, well, why work? Right. Why work if I don't get to keep any of the money that I earn? Um, and I think one of the things that was so inspirational about the, de the Declaration of Independence and the people's willingness to fight in rags and bare feet against the most powerful country in the world what, was because of the ability to have freedom and property and property rights. And this is why I believe history is so incredibly important to really understand the feudal system and the monarchies and the dictatorships and, the, and, the, and then later, of course, the communisms and the way people were actually living. Um, but it's a wonderful incentive to think, I have something for which to work. Um, and the other thing that is interesting and I would love for you to discuss we talked, we've talked about this a couple of times on the show, but I did a, I filmed a movie in communist China when I was in 1980 and a man was still alive who went through the cultural revolution over there with Mao and with the communism. And he talked about how they took the religion away. They took their freedom away. They took everything away. And he kept just telling, he just kept whispering in my ear, you know, how dangerous it was, how horrible it was. They took the arts away. They, they took, they, and of course, if you really study communism, they take all the brilliant people away. Um, they take 
and there's no incentive to do anything anymore. Um, and Atlas Shrug talks about that really beautifully. Of course, she was from a, a, a communist. I think she's from Russia, right? Mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. And uh, but when you, but I, I think that you can, you know, George Washington talked about the fact that in order, the problem with democracy is in order to 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 really understand to understand something, you have to feel it first. So people still think communism is a is a utopian thought, but when you really live it, I had a wonderful Academy Award winning actor whose name I won't say that I worked with, who said anyone that wants to believe in a communist system should just go live there. Yeah. See how they feel about that afterwards, mm -hmm. and um. Would you talk to us about this loss, uh, maybe talk about more the loss of incentive of people to, to and, and, you know, the one thing about the constitution, you get to own your rights. If you develop a wonderful medicine, you know, copyright, if you, do, if you write a wonderful book and there you owned nothing, you, you, you didn't get to own any of anything that you created. So people go, well, why create? I'll just sit here and drink a bottle of vodka. Yeah. Why well, go work? I don't get any of my money. I, why do anything? It's the, the loss of incentive um, is, is very, very devastating to the people. And I could really see the difference in China between the people that had lived before the revolution, Mao's revolution, the people that lived during the revolution and the kids that were, you know, raised after the revolution and that middle generation that had lived through it, and there were consequent, and, and, and the smart people, they took them off to concentration camps. They just took all the people, and they did this in Russia too, China and Russia, but they, they, they just looked dead in the eyes. You know, they didn't want to look at you. They didn't want to acknowledge you. You just, they were almost like lobotomized. It was really, really interesting. But someone who had lived before the revolution, this man that Chen Shu, I mean, I, we corresponded for years afterwards, he was colorful and bright and vibrant. And I think that that really, and it, it talked about the difference because the dumber they can keep you, the more they can control you. Um, and lastly, I'll say when I was in China, I was on this bus. And as they, I was going from Han, from uh, Zhuhai up to Canton. And uh, it was, there were people out there with their straw buckets, you know, o over their shoulders walking in very, very third world, very, very third world. And then I looked out and lo and behold, what did I see? three or four Mercedes and, you know, rich people out there. I thought, wait a minute. I, th I thought it was a utopian society. I thought everybody was supposed to be the same, mm -hmm. but it just doesn't exist because like you talked about the human corruption. Um, can you talk about the devastation and the starvation that happened with everyone when they tried this communal system? Um, they were talking about the other day that, that the Ukraine, they have, they were starved uh, by, um, I guess, one of them in, in Russia, the, the Ukrainians remember very deeply being starved by the communist Russian society. But under Stalin, of course, they were all murdered. So many were murdered and starved to death. Can, can you talk to that a little bit, please? Absolutely. And I think it gets to your original point on incentives. It's all about incentives. So again, because we assume rightly that humans operate in certain ways, we operate on our own self-interest. Again, this doesn't mean that we're never altruistic, but it does mean we're not altruistic all of the time, then we need the right incentives, social incentives, economic incentives, legal incentives to encourage us to work together rather than work against each other. And so I find it really interesting because Marx was kind of obsessed with materialism and his kind of um, decrying of the capitalist. So capitalist is a word that originates with Marx. It's a very derogatory word. Uh, so, you know, this kind of notion of the capitalists who are just making all this money, they're the materialists. But what's the interesting difference here is that in a free market economy, we don't all get rich at the same level, but we all get richer. So in free market economies, when they experience economic growth, you see economic growth that brings all income quintiles up. I mean, the opposite of this happens when you have communism, because the government is one monolithic agent that controls every element of society. And if you don't have prices, property rights, and the discipline of profit and loss, then you don't have the incentives for us to, again, we want entrepreneurs to wake up in the morning and say, hey, people have problems. I'm only gonna make money if I figure out a way to solve them, right? That, that's it. And people can walk away from me if I 
am incorrect, if I make a product wrong and it was an accidental mistake, or even if I engage in inappropriate behavior, right? Like I try to con people. That's what we assume is that people are fallible. They're always going to do those types of things, but you want a system that corrects for it. The communist system encourages plunder. It, it, and it's a destruction of our humanity. And if you read Ayn Rand, it's just so clear. It leaps off the pages that what is lost that's the most significant thing. It's not just you lose your money, you lose your, you lose your humanity, right? Because you're just a cog in the wheel of the state. So one of my favorite uh, cartoons, you could Google this. It's a political cartoon. I believe it came out in the 30s, maybe. And it's kind of a rhetorical statement on production in the Soviet Union under the Bolsheviks. And basically uh, what you see is, to, this is to the incentive story, that you know when you're not gonna use markets to establish incentives, right? So for example, how does Chick-fil-A know what to do? Well, they know what to do because consumers show up when they make chicken sandwiches a certain way, but it's also about their system, right? They deliver it fast, they're very polite. There's lots of reasons people go to Chick-fil-A. When Chick-fil-A starts to mess that up, consumers are gonna go somewhere else, right? Because you can get a chicken sandwich in a lot of different places. That's that discipline of profit and loss, right? They want our money, we want the chicken sandwich. And when in a free market economy, we both get what we want in a peaceful way. But in the Soviet Union under communism or in Mao's China under communism, examples you've given today, the problem is you're destroying those incentives. So in this nail factory, this is again a political cartoon, that comes out in the 30s, there's a huge nail, it's two tons, and it's hanging from a kind of over a conveyor belt from wires. And this is just a black and white drawing, right? And it basically is a commentary on under the Soviet Union because people didn't know what to do, right? Chick-fil-A knows what to do because consumers tell them. But under command and control economic systems, bureaucrats tell you what to do. So the bureaucrats say, make 2,000 pounds of nails. But it's easier to make one 2,000 pound nail than to make 2,000 pounds of usable nails. So what do they do? They make one 2,000 pound nail and they go home so they can do what? So what you already said, smoke and drink a lot of vodka because there was nothing to live for, right? You just wanted to not get put in the concentration camps. You were just trying to get done as fast as you could so you could save whatever what you know little family life was yours. And again, I would encourage people to read Ayn Rand too, because I think she just through story gives, you know, examples of this. But to me, this is the biggest destruction. It's, and the inequality that you've referenced, right? So there are people that are living large, right? So the bureaucrats might live large and the politicians might live large, but let me say this one thing. No politician in the Soviet Union, no matter how large they felt they lived, has anything compared to what an average American high school student has in 2022. Why? Because we live in an economy with economic freedom and that's all the difference. So ordinary, you don't have to be, you know, a Senator to drive a car or to have a cell phone or to use a laptop. These are luxuries that are extended to the whole population, right? So I, Marx was obsessed with egalitarianism, but I think capitalism delivers the goods, sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to turn it over to, to one of the greatest entrepreneurs I know with the freedom to create and who wants to change the world with her brilliant mind is Tova. But very, very quickly, can you just answer the question about the starvation? How the people, very quickly, because we, we I have to make sure everybody gets their time. Absolutely. The, the, the potato, the way they starved to death. And they yeah. starved, killed millions and millions of people. Just very briefly, like 60 seconds. Yeah, so very briefly, and this... It, Mao is a great example. Under Mao's China, because he told people what to do, he had weird visions of agricultural technology. It was all a product of his deranged head, but he used force to tell people what to do. So he took away their property, he put them on co-ops and communes, and they eventually, because you had no market, they ran, they literally ran out of food. So when you run out of food, you have famines, and there's an incredibly sad book, but it's it's worth reading. It's called um, Mao's Hungry Ghosts. And it's about the famine in Mao's China. And it basically talks about pe how people had to revert to cannibalism because their property was taken from them. The they, yeah, they, can, they can't grow taken. any vegetables on their own property. They because they run out of all the fertile land, right? So when you're farming, you can't just take it all. 
you have to think about the future seasons of farming. But without well, isn't that what happened with Stalin? Is Stalin took all the food? He, he took all the food for himself. They took all the food. They took, and I didn't have to turn it over. They took all the food from the capital. I mean, from the people, and took it to the government. And so the people starved, but the government wanted to have their food. Okay, greatest entrepreneur I know who's created an app and PSA and a marketing plan for us. Ko Tova, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Janine. And thank you, Dr. Bradley, for being on. Um, I'm really excited to get into it. Uh, so in class, uh, we were learning about, you know, governments, and we kind of were talking about like a political compass scale. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, where uh, it's like two axes, and one is like leftist economics. So, um, so like, you know, communism on one side, and like pure capitalism on the other. And then like above and below was like, authoritarianism. And then like liberty, like complete libertarianism. Okay. And so they were saying how how communism would be the kind of combination of like authoritarian, high authoritarianism and high, you know, very far left policies uh, and things like that. So I was curious, um, can you, like, is it possible to have a communist system with civil liberties at all? Like, is it is it even possible to separate, you know, the economic system of communism from the I guess more authoritarian social social system that has kind of followed it. That's a great question, Tova. Thank you for that. Um, so a couple things I want to say. I'll try to be brief because I know we have a lot to get through. But I think that there are two thinkers: Milton Friedman, of course, Nobel Prize winning economist, and F. A. Hayek. And F. A. Hayek was directly taking on, as was Milton Friedman, but they were directly taking on the contingent of economists who were flirting with more central planning in the 20th century. So that's a little bit of a different story, but the point that they bring up is this. You cannot have political freedom, which is to say democracy. You cannot have that without first having economic freedom and free markets. So that's called the Hayek-Friedman hypothesis. So basically in both of their individual works, I really recommend Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, because he talks a lot about this. There is a relationship of the democracy and markets that coexist. So I think the answer to your question is on a societal level, it's impossible. It's impossible to have a broadly communist society where, again, you've eradicated property rights, which means if you don't have property rights, you don't have the incentives for entrepreneurship, right, and problem solving. And you also don't have prices. And so people in charge have to figure those things out. And so because you've taken away the incentives for productivity, you have to use force to get people to do what you want them to. So another great book, I know I'm throwing out a lot of books, so I'll maybe try to type it in the chat later, is Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics. It's a great book because it's very accessible. It's not technical at all. He's a very famous economist, came up out of UCLA. I use it to teach with. So in this book, in chapter two, he talks about prices and he explicitly references the Soviet Union. And he says, basically, the, the economists who were hired to work for the regime all had PhDs. So these are not, these are smart people, right? But the, and the, the two particular Russian economists that worked during that time had written a book and he kind of tra uh, translates some of the passages and he talks about how there were all these shortages. And so the Kremlin is calling and saying, fix the problem, change the prices, fix the problem. But they said, we have 200 million prices to control. We don't have any time. See, the thing is in a market economy, the prices control themselves. Right, they go up or down based on changing levels of scarcity. So the reason I'm getting back to the prices part is because that's a peaceful way to adjust, right? You don't have to tell people to do things. The price goes up or down and people respond, both consumers and demand and suppliers, right? But in the Soviet system, in a communist system, any communist system, you have to use force. Venezuela, we're seeing that, right? As you begin to socialize the economy and control economic resources from the top down, you got to up the authoritarianism. So I think that it's impossible on a society-wide level. I think people have romantic flirt flirtations with it. So Deirdre McCloskey is another great econ uh, contemporary economist who I like a lot. She's written a bunch of books on the bourgeois virtues. And she says that our flirtation with kind of communism and socialism comes from where what, what we're born into, which is the family. And when you think about it, the family is a unit of sharing. Right. It's a unit of I don't make my kids buy their breakfast from me. I give them their breakfast. So I'm the my husband and I are the benevolent planners 
But why does it work? Because it's a small group of people. And what's most important, we love each other. <laughs> we love each other. So it works because I love them. I can monitor their behavior, right? And we kind of operate as a family unit. So McCloskey thinks this kind of experience that is very formative for all of us makes us believe we can extend a sharing economy onto a nation. And it doesn't work. It breaks apart because you don't know enough to know who should do what. I can know that in my family. And you don't have prices. And so again, you're, the, the incentive to do the right thing breaks down. So I hope that answers your question, Tova. Yeah, it definitely does. I hadn't ever thought about it in that family structure. So that's really fascinating. Um, and then I was curious, you know, if you kind of uh, reject, you know, the model that you, the idea that on a large scale, you can have, you know, economic communism without the social, you know, repressiveness. You know, how do you make sense of, of, or help me make sense of countries like, you know, China, where like they are obviously very authoritarian and very communist government, but it seems like they've been definitely moving towards capitalism of late, but haven't gotten any less regressive, at least to me, it seems. Um, and then countries like, for example, Great Britain, who are uh, considered, you know, a liberal government or, you know, capitalist government, but do have sections of their economy, like the healthcare system that are like completely nationalized? Great question again, Tova. Um, these are great questions. I, I would say this. So as far as China goes, I think we're watching a country in the middle of its industrial revolution, which is quite a thing to watch. Since 1978, limited reforms in China that lifted some property, that lifted some price flexibility. Um, in the past 40 years since that occurred, 800 million people lifted out of abject poverty in China alone. So it's really amazing what a little bit of markets do, right? A little bit. This is not a capitalist country though. I would never describe it that way. It's a corporatist economy, uh, lots of state-owned enterprises, control of the media, all sorts of stuff. So I think it's there's been some opening up and they've got some economic growth out of it. The World Bank classifies China as a middle income country, which of course it was not 40 years ago. So that's some progress. That's a good thing. We want that progress. I actually, my own opinion, I could be wrong. You could ask a lot of economists this, you might get different answers, but my own opinion is they're, they're involved in their own undoing right now. So just because you get on the road to economic progress does not mean that you can sustain it, right? So again, that Hayek-Friedman hypothesis says you have to have free markets before you can have democracy. I think China liberalized a little bit of its, econ its economy, but it didn't go all the way. And so without going all the way, I don't think you can have democracy in China, not right now. Now, that doesn't mean it's not ever possible. I think it's possible in some universe that China could be wealthy, healthy, and democratic. We've seen countries go from you know, extreme poverty and authoritarianism and change. But I think you look at Venezuela and you can see that the change can happen in the other direction, right? Venezuela 30 years ago was the richest country in Latin America. It was, it was becoming a democracy, all these types of things, and it has just eroded all that. So wealth and freedom and you know, um, free societies can be eroded. Um, and I think that those are really important things to think about. What was the second country you asked me about? I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I answer the whole question. I'm sorry, yeah, the, the UK right, where, right. you know, they, yeah. they have freedoms, but they have certain sections of their economy that are nationalized. Yeah, so this is an important point too. I think I would describe most modern economies as mixed economies, including the United States. It's a mixed economy. It's not a pure capitalist economy. There's a lot of government intervention. But again, that scale that you're learning about, that's important, right? Because we want to learn where we sit on the scale and then that can help us think about what we could do to improve. Because remember, economists always think about relative institutions and the different outcomes you get in those institutions. So in Great Britain, my argument would be the healthcare market would be so much more productive in Great Britain if it was liberalized. So I wouldn't call Great Britain socialist. I would just call it there's lots, you know, in that particular industry, there's lots of government control, which means the market isn't going to perform as well. So I think those are, you know, and we look at the Nordic models. A lot of times I get asked about the Nordic models. These are kind of um, social democracies, right? Where there's a very large social safety net, which requires a very high level of taxation. But those societies are still pretty, score pretty well on indicators of free open societies in terms of the economic freedom. So I would say it's, again, all on the range, right? But that helps us learn what policies need fixing 
so that we can get more prosperity and get more economic growth? So that's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so then from your perspective, do you feel like less government involvement is always going to make the society happier and more productive? Or do you think there's a limit where you, you can go too far in the other direction? Or do you think that direction is always better? Do you mean in terms of government intervention in economic affairs? Right, like, do you think, yeah, yeah in government intervention in economic affairs is less always better? Or do you have to have, or, or can you get too, too few government involvement too in your opinion? Yeah, too so I think it depends on what we're talking about because it's always about your starting point, right? So the US healthcare market, if somebody asked me to comment on that, I would say it's one of the most regulated elements of the American economy. American banking, highly regulated. Higher education in America, highly regulated, heavily subsidized. All three of these sectors don't perform like they could, right? And it's not an accident to me why. So there I would say more markets are better. In general, I would follow Hayek and Friedman and their advice on this. I think liberalizing economies is the right thing to do. This doesn't mean that you never have a regulation. It doesn't mean that you destroy law. And it certainly doesn't mean that you just like toss the government, right? So I would, I kind of like to categorize the three main spheres of, of society are the market, the state, and civil society. So philanthropic, communal activities. These are really important community activities. And it's like a Venn diagram, right? Those spheres overlap. They need each other. But what's important, I think, and where if you look at our founding fathers, what they were worried about is that the government would grow in size and scope. And they were right. The government has grown in size and scope. So I think my answer most of the time to that question is let's roll back government intervention, whether it's price controls or whether it's excessive regulations that make it difficult for businesses to do what they need to do, all these types of, or heavy subsidies, trade barriers, these types of things tend to make industries more sluggish, which means we just get less growth and consumers get less stuff at, and they pay higher prices. And so those things are what we want to avoid. Thank you. Um, and then I know I am going to pass it on to you to Jill and Jordan, but just a brief question um, from a capitalist perspective, without resorting to more government control or communist policies, what do you think the solution is to combating inequality? Or do you think that's even a goal uh, society needs to have? Yeah, I think we need to be real. So you're asking such great questions, and I know I need to be very quick, but you're asking the, the right questions that are hot button topics right now. I think equality is just um, a, a really complex and nuanced problem. So I have no problem with inequality in a market economy in the sense that when somebody like Jeff Bezos invents Amazon from his garage, and now I live in a world where I can get packages in two days, that's a great thing, right? Because I'm benefiting from his thinking and he's doing that in competition with other companies who are trying to do the same thing. That's great. That kind of inequality, it doesn't just make Bezos richer, it makes all of us richer. Great, that, that kind of inequality is uplifting to the whole you know, society or all of the citizens. The type of inequality that I worry about is the type of inequality we've kind of been talking about. Who's on top? Why, do, why are they on top, right? So if a Bezos is on top because he's coming up with great ideas, I'm happy for that. If a Bezos is on top though, because he can use his economic wealth to influence the rules of the game, we call that cronyism, and that's a real problem for income inequality. So the mighty need to fall is what I'm trying to say, right? When you have a bad business idea, I don't care who you are, you need to be punished through profit and loss for that. And if the government kind of saves you or cushions your fall, then what do we do? We change incentives. So more in the future, we're gonna get bad decisions, bad business decisions, we're gonna need more bailouts. So I really think, that's a complex answer to that question, but I would say in general in a market, I'm not worried about people getting rich if they're helping us with their inventions, right? I am worried about people getting rich through the state. Great, thank you. Wow, you're, it's an impressive skill to be able to condense like hundreds of years of political thought into like 30 seconds. I appreciate it. Um, and now I'd like to pass on to Jewel and Jordan. All right, thanks for the great show so far. Um, so. Yeah. Couple questions. Uh, Jordan and I tried to put ours together because we're tight on time. So, in a communist economy, as far as currency goes, um, how does that work? So, well, for, sorry, go ahead. No, just go ahead, answer. 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is the problem. So one of the things that we measure in economic freedom is the soundness of the currency, which we tie back to the independence of the central bank. So we want an independent central bank, right? So the, in, the central bank isn't making money or interest rate decisions based on political right choices or who's in office or favoring one party over another, but rather that money supply should meet money demand. And so again, the problem in a communist country is this, yes, there's gonna be a currency, yes, it's gonna be necessary, but because you really destroyed commerce, the central bank is going to have to guess what money demand is, if that makes sense, right? In a market economy, people wanna hold the currency because it allows them to buy things. And so it's, it's more obvious to the central bank what to do. That doesn't mean central banks, even in free market economies, always do the right thing, of course. Right, but they have a metric to go from. Whereas in, again, in a communist society, the government ensconces everything, right? So you have this monolithic agency that's deciding everything. Who produces what, when, how often, how much is it going to cost? And then they also have to make currency decisions. So the thing about communist economies is everything is entirely arbitrary. And that's the problem, right? Because we live in a world of scarce resources as such, we can't make arbitrary decisions about who gets what. We don't want to make, you know, we don't, we don't want to do it that way. We actually want to find ways to discover, to learn, uh, to engage in stewardship. So anyway, I think that money is tied and currency issues are tied directly to the problem of you need have these very powerful people and they're going to have to guess. Yeah. And then it just, it's, it's, it's so, it's almost, uh, it seems so crazy to think of a government trying to control every single thing that we're talking about right now, but I guess many people think that it should try to. Um, so then one, one thing that is interesting, when I was in school, we recently graduated, I would uh, quite often, Jordan was there, and we would have to speak our mind and say an unpopular opinion around communism. And um, we had a, one professor who was a um, communist constructivist. And we had to had to argue a lot about a lot of things. Um, one thing was one thing I noticed, and I never got to research too much, was that oftentimes when an industry is socialized, it almost um, piggybacks off of non-socialized elements in an economy. If you look at like where the wealth production actually is, um, but that's a very hard thing to to even try to research and to try to explain. So is there anything on that topic that you'd want to say? Because when we talk about, sometimes when you get into a conversation about socialized uh, elements in an economy, someone will point to some success of it or in another country, how this works. And, and um, it always seems disingenuous to me because normally there's something else producing the wealth in that nation. Yes, so no, virtually no economy is cut off from some markets, right? I mean, even Mao's China or the Soviet Union, they were to some extent interacting with the rest of the world. It was limited and that kept people poor, of course, but you're right. I mean, you're not living in a, you know, kind of in a um, research lab. Communism doesn't happen in a research lab where we can control all the variables. So I do think that this is very disingenuous at times, right? Because you'll hear people say, well, so one of the biggest arguments that Hayek um, was fighting against, and his professor Ludwig von Mises in the 20th century, is that American economists were looking at the Soviet economy in the 30s. They were seeing positive GDP growth, which is a measure for output growth, right? Which is a measure for income. So they're looking at that in the 30s, and they're saying things like, maybe we should try central planning, central planning here, right? Because if if it's all about GDP growth, that's and that that's what we're maximizing. That's a success story, right? So I, I get these questions from my students a lot. And what Hayek was saying is just because you build things doesn't mean they create value. That's the problem with communism. You can build bridges. Guess what will grow GDP? This is a very kind of like makes your hair stand up. Building gas chambers and hiring people to execute other people will grow GDP. Just creating those jobs grows GDP. Does that create value? Of course not, it destroys value, right? So you can get temporary successes I was involved in a debate with someone who was arguing for a greater socialized health care in the United States. And at the end, she said, well, at least in socialist economies, we're getting people in lines and that's good. And people clapped for her. And I thought, why are we clapping about people standing in a line? 
Do you want to stand in a line when you need surgery? No. So it's, it's a misrepresentation of parts for the whole, right? And so I think we have to go, that's why I think economics is very powerful. We go in and say, okay, the Soviet Union did this and this and this, and some of it might have been not horrible, right? But it could always be better. That's what economists do. We say, what are the relative alternatives? So that's how you have to hold people to the fire, right? GDP didn't grow forever in the Soviet Union. They were bankrupted ultimately because you can't, you can run a country into the ground. It, it took them 80 years, but they did it, right? And so this is not the way you get sustainable long-term economic growth. That's how you hold people to the fire. Not like this is, again, it takes it out of the ideological fight, which I think is good and say, okay, how are we going to sustain that forever? How are we going to do away with the lines? How are we going to make sure when they go to the store, there's bread? And they, I think with that, those are hard questions for people like that to answer. Yeah, thank you very much. But we have some great audience questions. This has been a pretty awesome show. Well, thank you, Jill and Jorn, and thank you, Dr. Bradley. We've uh, One of our listeners, Rick Mayberry, says, this is fantastic. A clear, concise, and understandable message and lesson. Thank you. So thank you for that. Uh, John Chambers, one of our listeners, writes, since in communism, everything is for the good of the community, i.e. the commune or the collective, and the leaders have to decide what is the good of the community, how does communist theory say the leaders arrive at what is the good? Uh, John says he's not found that they have any procedure and is wondering if you've found anything like that. No, I have not found anything. I think, again, this is one of those examples of where it's entirely arbitrary. It's entirely based on what the leadership is going to promise. And keep in mind, and obviously everybody knows this, but, you know, Marx himself wasn't promising human immiseration and, you know, um, execution lines. They were promising utopia and it just happened to be in a propertyless society and again it's so funny john that you asked this question because one if you look at americans who are surveyed about socialism and communism but in particular communism the thing that they like the most from marx's communist manifesto is to each according to their needs that is an appeal to our emotional idealization of equality right and i get that i have two kids they're they're little-ish and they are obsessed with equality. And I actually am going to warp them because I talk about all the time how they should stop their obsession with equal outcomes. Like if one gets a lollipop, the other one wants it, or all this stuff, right? So you see it very, it's part of human nature. And so I think Americans who think communism is a good idea are picking up on, it would be nice if we were more equal. Although I would argue economically, it would be horrible if we were all equal. There's going to be no Amazon to deliver stuff to us if we're all equal. We are different and we need each other. But to answer your question, it's it's fully it was fully clear that Marx and his elitist group thought that they were going to make the rules. And they were never clear about what those rules were going to be. And the mechanism for making the decisions is was just entirely arbitrary. It was made up. So therefore, it was going to be entirely dependent at all times on who was in power. And so I think this is the problem. For example, Mao was obsessed with steel production, obsessed. And he was insane. I mean, deranged. He had people, backyard steel furnaces, melting down whatever they could find. This is not steel production. And he said, we're going to beat the, the Great Britain. We're going to outproduce them in steel. And it's insane. But what did people do? They fell in line to make steel because they were going to get killed if they didn't, right? So it's just entirely arbitrary what's going to happen. It's entirely arbitrary what the rules are going to be. And what this kind of, quote, propertyless system, who's going to run it? Marx knew it was going to be the leaders, but I think he was silent on how it was going to maintain its peacefulness. Very interesting. And John Chambers also added that his parents visited the USSR in the 1960s, and they said they knew when they had arrived back in the West because people were smiling again. Yeah. Which is sad, but also probably true. Um, Brian Ernst writes, are fascism Ooh. and communism two sides of the same coin in that both systems contemplate complete government, well, let me try again. Are fascism and communism two sides of the same coin in that both systems attempt complete governmental control of the economy, uh, such as if the government bends far enough right or left, they end up with the same results? Yes, I mean, the short answer to that is when we're talking about the control of economic resources, there's very little difference, right? So 
the government as this unit is going to decide who produces what. Now, the form that that takes could be different. It could be all state-owned enterprises. It could be through government agencies or bureaucracies. So they are very much two sides of the same coin. And the problem, again, is when you try to ordain an economy from the top down, that requires that you know certain things, all the way things can produce, all the things people want, and all the possible arrangements of resources that can go into making those things. And of course, the problem, whether it's fascism doing it, communism doing it, is that people don't know. So that was Hayek's big argument in the 20th century was that, I mean, his Nobel winning paper was called The Use of Knowledge in Society. And he's directly talking to academics who are advocating for socialism. But he never brings up the word socialism. He just says, we don't know what to produce. We need a market economy because prices are decentralized. And so they communicate information better and faster. And so I think fascism has the exact same economic problems and yields the same economic immiserating outcomes. Yeah, great question. Um, and then we have time probably for one more. Vincent Romano asks, wouldn't you agree that communism emerged in the industrialized nations because the worker population was growing? Capitalists understood that and responded. However, the Soviets, Mao, and Castro applied communism to agricultural peasant society. Is that the reason for the failures? I'm not, so I guess if the question is asking, is it just because it was applied to agricultural society and that was the failure? I mean, I think partly because as economies are becoming more industrialized, you're going from, you know, societies that are almost entirely agricultural. So if you're going to make that a central planning experiment, then you are by definition really control, you know, kind of using central control over the entire economy. At that time, you know, as you head into the industrial revolution, you're dealing with, you know, what 97% of the labor force is involved in agriculture. So the industrial revolution, of course, is what changes that. And then, but you're right. I mean, the, the Marx was all about class warfare, right? And the role of the proletariat and, and of course their role in bringing about this revolution. So I think the language and the rhetoric of it is supposed to be empowering to the working class, right? Who now they find themselves off the family farm and they're in manufacturing conditions. Of course, at the time, it's not very pleasant, right? An American working or even somebody in, you know, kind of most industrialized economies today, working in a manufacturing plant has no similarities to what it did in the 18th or 19th century. So it's, it's a very different experience. So I think they were absolutely playing on that feeling of what Marx called alienation. But I think no matter what sector you try this in, that sector is going to fail. I think that, but the fact that it was done with, through agriculture was very intentional because it was most of the economy. Well, and that's a great way to close. We appreciate so much your time. We are right at time. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. And we want to invite everybody to come back next week because we're going to be talking about socialism. And we've got a great guest, uh, Daniel DeMartino, who is a Venezuelan freedom activist and economist who's going to be with us. And uh, Janine, is there anything you'd like to say to close? Yeah, I've got the sun coming in here and I have no curtain that I can close because it broke. So I don't know. Hi, everyone. Um, Dr. Bradley, you were terrific and really, really fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Tova and Jewel and Jordan and Kathy and Aubrey. What a wonderful show. And see you next week to talk about socialism. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Thanks for having me. Thank you.